Trying to connect. There you go. Good morning. Uh, glad to have you here uh, for the stream of the Genesis Church service. And it's been a good first half, and hopefully it's not going to go downhill from here. Y'all, please let us know who you are and talk to us in the comments. If there's anybody that we can pray for, please put it in the comments or message me, and we'll be glad to. Well, as I went through the week, I started seeing a recurring theme in different situations I was involved with. Started on Monday. I received some news I was not very happy about. It wasn't anything serious, but it stung me in my pride. And I don't consider myself an extremely prideful person, but sometimes, like everybody else, I got a little bit of an ego. And not everybody can be as humble as our son there. But <laughs> <laughs> you know I could I mean that that one was Taylor May boy, I had to. <laughs> and then later on in the week. We were trying to help somebody. Somebody we had helped several times. And they basically let us know that we were just bothering them. And that hurt. Sometimes that happens where you have, you reach out, you reach out, and that person seemed to be ungrateful for the help we were offering and all the things we've done. And I was sitting there thinking, well, how offended I was. How could that person do that? Now I started thinking, as I'm looking around at my roof and the job I have to go to and the blessed family I have, maybe that person wasn't by their stuff. Maybe we both had a little gratitude deficiency. Because what I had gotten news about was basically I was throwing a pity party with God. Why didn't you open this door? I would have been a rock star at this. Why didn't you open this door? Forgetting all the doors he's opened, all the things he's done, he didn't deserve any of them. Most of us, me included, we go through our everyday lives aware of what's wrong in our lives. Not the newest this, that tire's about to show tread, that refrigerator ain't quite as cold as it was, we came in this morning, we can turn on the lights, nothing happened. We're getting a quote for an electrician, by the way. By the way, five minutes later, they pop on. You know, I'm sitting there looking at them, and, you know, for a moment, I didn't think about what a blessing this building has been and how blessed we are to be here. This time last year, we had an indoor waterfall in our rental building. We didn't want one, and it just happened. It can be hard to stop and think about everything that God's doing in our lives. We were originally created by God to be creatures of thankfulness and gratitude. Gratitude's mentioned all through the Bible. Even to this day, we're hardwired to react positively to gratitude and thankfulness. These effects came from the Psychology Today magazine article about the bodily responses to showing thankfulness and gratitude. Physical effects, you have a stronger immune system. The aches and pains don't bother you. Nearly as bad. Lower blood pressure. You exercise more. You tend to take better care of yourself. And you sleep longer and you feel a little bit better when you have slept. Psychologically, higher levels of positive emotions. If you're grateful and you're thankful, you see the good in other things. More alert, more alive, more awake. You got a little bit more joy, a little bit more optimistic. And when you're around people, you seem to be a little bit more helpful and generous, compassionate. And who wants to be around Nancy Nancy? Is not a Nancy Nancy, and I hope there's no one named Nancy listening to this. And Nancy <laughs> But Nancy's one of the most positive, this Nancy's one of the most positive people I've ever met. Through storms in her life that would have had me throwing myself a pity party, this lady keeps on going and still keeps showing compassion. But I have worked with some folks that have been, uh, let's just say there could be an improvement in the positivity. They'll drain you. But when you feel a little more thankful, a little more outgoing, and you don't feel quite alone. And if we're meant to be grateful and thankful and it's hardwired, what happened? 
our fallen world distorted that gratitude into ingratitude or complacency. You know, if there's one sin that's really prevalent today, ingratitude. God does so much for us, and our debt to Him is enormous. Can't pay it back, even if we want to. Bad thing is, we don't even hardly offer thanks for what He has done. When was the last time you've been in a restaurant and there were half the people? And you can go after the service, go to anywhere. Look around. Listen. How many people say a blessing before they eat Sunday dinner out anymore? How many of them say it before they even eat in anymore? And now, granted, I, I love a good meal as much as anybody, and even the pastor sometimes will start tearing into that chicken leg and realize, <laughs> okay, I got to stop. I think we're like this little fella that he was given an orange by a man, and his mom said, what do you say to the nice man? The little boy thought about hand the orange back and said, peel it. <laughs> I think that's kind of where we're, you know, where we're at. How would you describe yourself this morning? Content? From a sense of gratitude towards God for all he does or complacent? Well, it's like where you're at. Knee deep and everything going wrong. It is okay if you don't like the answer. Any pastor, shepherd, preacher, whatever they want to call themselves, you know, they say that they are thankful for God every single moment, every single day, and they don't throw themselves a pity party. They're better at the night. Because Monday afternoon, I was just, I just didn't want to get that news anyway. They passed up a rock star. I just hate that. Well, I hope it goes well, secretly inside. Oh, the little teenage boy was really like, okay, because there, I kind of have the, I kind of have a drive, and I think I have a little chip. Probably now we grew up on the Mill Hill and wear shoals, and sometimes you know you come from the Mill Village or you come from, uh, it, it was a good neighborhood, but there's that sense of competition that you always have when people come from a little bit better walk of life. And I've been competitive with it my whole, whole life. And I think it shows a little bit in my career. And it's a, and Monday was a little hurt for that. It was a sting to that pride. So, pastors is just like anybody else. We struggle sometimes with a little ingratitude, a little complacency. We aren't the first people to struggle with it, though. Attitude of gratitude sounds really good. It's hard to keep. It's hard to get. It's hard to keep. And we aren't the first ones. The scripture we're going to look at today are some folks that Jesus Christ literally saved their lives. We're going to see how they reacted to it. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Now, setting this up in verse 11 describes Jesus, he's on his way to Jerusalem, and he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. Jesus was probably in his final year of his earthly ministry. He was probably 33. He had began his public ministry at 30, had a three-year ministry. <clears throat> Jerusalem was located in Palestine, and that was the Roman name for the bottom half of Israel. If you look at bottom and top, and the Romans called... Israel, Palestine, or Judea. That's why you see a lot of um, have the terminology changes from the Old Testament to the New because the Romans came in and they were writing in Roman times. Now Samaria, when you hear that mentioned, like the Good Samaritan, Samaria was the top half. It used to be called, that was actually called the Kingdom of Israel. It had split apart. And then it was conquered by the Assyrians about 100 years before the Babylonians conquered the lower half. And what the Assyrians did, they took those Israelites, which were descendants of 10 of the sons of Jacob, and they scattered them all the way across the Assyrian Empire. <coughs> Have you ever heard the term the lost tribes of Israel? That was it. And what they did was move their own people in. And it created problems, friction between the people in the south, the 
descendants of two of the sons. Well, actually, two sons of uh, uh, one son and then one son of Joseph. But they were it creates that friction because they came in. They were different culturally. They had different gods. They didn't like each other. The Jews looked down their noses at the Sumerians, and fights would break out sometimes. Still breaking out. The people in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem are descendants of those Samaritans. They're still fighting. Samaritans, Philistines, Malachites, Edomites, and other ancient enemies of Israel. It's still going on today. <coughs> Jesus and his disciples were right on the border of Palestine and Samaria. And have you ever been in a spiritual or physical illness and thought you were alone? I'm about to meet some people that have. Just like this verse, Jesus is going where he's needed. He could have went different roads to get to where he needed to go. He went this way. For a particular reason, Jesus never did anything by coincidence, and he still doesn't. Verses 12 and 13, when he entered this village, there were ten lepers. Ten men with leprosy stood at a distance, and they met him, and they shouted, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And leprosy is a skin disease that can be contagious, and it affects the nerve endings and muscles and the skin, and people can lose fingers and toes. I think, has anybody ever watched Ben Hur? Like the Charlton Heston version, it's, it's a great movie. Anyway, it's a his mother and sister end up with him. They wrap their hands in bandages and they cover their face because their nose falls off and all these things. It's a terrible disease and it's highly contagious. It's treatable now, but it wasn't up until the 20th century. At this time, there were no medical treatments for it. What they had to do were people who caught leprosy, they couldn't live in the village with other people. Not by choice, but by law. There were laws given back in the Old Testament but from God to Moses on more than just religion, but how to treat diseases, how to have sanitary conditions. And that was part of it. They lived on the fringes. They may see their family go by, but they had to stand at a distance and shout to them. That's as close as they could ever get. And it's kind of similar to how we are now. The isolation. And I can only imagine the heartbreak. They were considered unclean by no choice of their own. They didn't ask for this. Law didn't allow them contact with other people. They couldn't come any closer than six feet. Or the old equivalent to six feet. Uh, whenever I read that, I thought it was really ironic. They had to warn people that they were near, and they did so by shouting, unclean, unclean. And that adds another element to this isolation, this loneliness. The only place they could live was with other lepers. The only food they could have would be dependent on the mercy of others to leave it. As sinners, aren't we in the same situation they are? Aren't we cut off? Outside looking in? We think we have no access to God and we are the lepers. I think we've all been in situations that we thought we were untouchable. We thought we were alone. We thought no one knew what we were going through. No one wanted to be around us. No one wanted to touch us. They had a need that only Jesus can answer. They'd been out there probably for years, shouting, thinking they were alone. They stood at a distance and cried out to him, and evidently they'd heard of his ability to heal the sick. When he passed by, they cried out. They identified who he was. Jesus, Master, he's the one that can help. In fact, he's still the only one that can help. In your time of need, you need to realize just as they did, Jesus is the only one that can answer your need. They called him by name, Jesus Master. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's power in his name. There's power in his name. 
when Jesus saw them in verse 14, he said, go and show yourself to the priest. As they were going, they were cleansed. And they responded to the command of Jesus in obedience. This is something that Jesus still expects of us. We have a relationship with Jesus. In a relationship, just like with a spouse or between parents and children, there's responsibilities on both sides. We have a responsibility to him. Obedience. They didn't second guess him. They did. They didn't argue the point with him. They might have said, well, Jesus, we know this guy who's healed by you, and he said you touched him, so why don't you touch us, or why don't you just speak it? How many of us have acted like that? I've ordered God pizza in the past. Extra grace, hold the accountability. I need this. I need this right now, just like I planned. I don't need you to add any anything extra to it. We want Jesus' help, but we want it in our way. We want it to be convenient for us, or we really don't want to let go of the situation. How many of us have had situations that we don't want to let go of? They're tearing us apart. Tiger by the tail, like the old Buck Owens song. And we don't want to set it loose. Pride? Could be. Ego? Could be. Could be a sense of control that we think we're the only ones that can solve it. And if God just went along with our plan, it'd just all be taken care of. Why didn't he on board? When we pray for family members that have gone away from God, are we leaving it on the table for Jesus or are we picking it back up to try and fix it? I've been guilty of both. When you said yes on picking it up, you're not alone. And this message isn't to throw rocks at anybody because we're all big, hot messes, all of us. It's hard to leave things like that for Jesus to take care of. It's hard to put your child on the table. It's hard to put your brother on the table. It's hard to put your mom or dad or grandchildren on the table and take your hands off and say, I've done all I can do. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to see how fast that redoes. <laughs> there we go. All right. Uh, and like I said, we're getting a, a quote for a new electric person <laughs> last <electrical. laughs> <sighs> We want Jesus to work in our lives in the way we wanted to, not according to his plan. These men had reached the end of their rope. They had hit rock bottom. They were going to die if someone done. They submitted there was no pride left. No ego, no selfishness, no complacency, no gratitude. Just a desire to get better. Paraphrasing Dr. Billy Graham, where men end, God begins. And that's when Jesus goes to work. Jesus told them to go and show themselves to the priest, and, and this was the law. They would have to come and demonstrate to the priest that they had been healed in order to be accepted into the village again. <coughs> and they went clean. This disease gone. This death sentence that they had gone. We all face a spiritual leprosy. We're decaying without Jesus in our life and that cleansing. Now, verses 15 and 16, one of them, remember it was 10. Jesus healed 10 men. When he saw he'd been healed, turned back and glorifying God in a loud voice, and he fell on his face, his feet, giving thanks to him. He was a Samaritan. The other nine were Jews. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> we are fine, Greg. We're fine. It's all good. Because <laughs> when the devil 
so cool. When we start having technical <laughs> issues, that means the devil don't like what we're saying, and that means somebody needs to hear it. That's so right. it is all good. We have had times where this where this stuff didn't even work. And as far as gratitude, I give lots of gratitude to those two in the back. They're here almost every Sunday. They have been with us, and Greg goes out of his way to keep that working. These ten men, they had their life back. Their fingers and toes were decaying. They didn't want to look in the reflection of a river for what they would see. They had to live off scraps left to them by others outside their village. Jesus came into the lives of these men. He was the reason they were healed. Leprosy is a death sentence. In the life of Jesus like that, we may have success in the world, this world, but we won't in the next. Because we're all going to have eternal life. It's a choice of where we're going to have it at. Heaven or hell. Sometimes pastors don't want to talk about hell, but it's reality. Hell is the absence of God. It's not the fire. It's not the sulfur. That's not what is so painful. But even in our worst time in this world, God's still there. Jesus is still there. How many of us have been healed spiritually or physically by Jesus? And how many times? I can't even count in my life. There was a point in my life where I didn't have two dimes to rub together. And my world fell apart. And I didn't know where God was at. But he showed up in a major way. And if you told me 10, 15, 20 years ago I'd be up here right now, I would have laughed at you. If you told me 6 or 7, I would have looked at you funny. And I was, we were already coming to church real steady by then. How many times have we told Jesus thank you for what he does do? How many times do we start prayer with thank you? How many times have we just went on with our lives? These questions I ask, they sting, with, they sting me when I ask them. Would it hurt to show or express gratitude to God for blessing us and giving us grace and mercy when none of us, none of us deserve it? We all fall short of the glory of God, all of us. I think it's important to look at verse 16. It was the Samaritan that came back, shouting glory to God. Showing his gratitude. This man wasn't raised up worshiping God. He came to Jesus because he was dying of slow death from a fatal disease along with the other nine. And Jesus healed all of them. Think about the sincerest, most thankful Christians you have ever met. Some of them raised up in the church. Some of them came to Jesus behind bars. Some of them came to Jesus because they didn't have a vein left in either arm, either foot, even in their neck. I've taken care of heroin addicts that literally, they were hitting veins in their neck, could have punctured their lungs. Jesus saved them. It wasn't made. It wasn't made. Jesus uses people for his power of Christ. This Samaritan, this man that was unclean to come into the temple in Jerusalem. He knew the reason he was saved and why he was alive again to his family and friends. It was Jesus and this man wasn't afraid to praise God in public and to tell people who had delivered him from the awful life he was living. We're in a culture now that people think twice about saying Merry Christmas, Happy Easter, having a cross in the front yard. But more than a cross in the front yard is behavior. Are we showing our gratitude towards Christ in public? Not to draw attention to ourselves, but to draw attention to Him. To show people what Christians are really like.
God became the focus of this man's life through his healing, he'd been an idol worshiper. Aren't some of us? Chasing money. And there ain't nothing wrong with wealth. There ain't nothing wrong with it. Wealth, alcohol, drugs, tobacco, gambling, whatever, even religion, can become an obsession. A lot of people are obsessed with religion, but they ain't obsessed with God. They're obsessed with the rules. They're obsessed with the standards, but they're not obsessed with Jesus. Jesus' healing is capable of so much more than physical healing. And there are people today who are sick with sin in their souls. And it's eating them from the inside out. They're worshiping pills and meth and money and power and the bottle as their idols. How many of us are willing to go and get up in public and tell how Jesus turned our lives around and saved us from eternal death? Turned our relationships around with our families. Those other nine men were Jewish. They were raised up in households that should have been worshiping God. And they knew this was the power of God that healed them. They were losing their fingers, their toes, their sensation, the end of their nose, and they were clean. They knew something had happened in their lives. What did they do? Just what they had to do in order to get back in their lives. And then it was Jesus who. I have no, I don't know, but I would not be surprised if some of the families of these people or these people themselves were not in that crowd later on in this year calling for his death. That Samaritan wouldn't have been. I've been the Samaritan that was healed. I've been among the other the, the nine. How about y'all? In verses 17, 18, 19, Jesus asked, No one was found who returned to give glory to God except for this foreigner. And he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Jesus came to these men. He chose the road to be on. It's not by coincidence. Woman is the well. Lazarus. These people, the blind, it was all by design. He could have chosen another way. He could have ignored these men. At this point in time in Jesus' ministry, every miracle put him a step towards that cross. It made the Pharisees and scribes hate him that much more, but he still took it, took the time. It was expected to ignore these men because they were unclean. Jesus did, and he put his healing into the lives of these men, their families, and friends. And How many of us have been spiritual lepers? Been ignored and avoided by people because of sin that was destroying us? How many times did Jesus get on the road to the destruction that we were on there? To turn us around. Did he heal you spiritually and or physically like these ten men? How many of them gave the glory to God for the healing? One out of ten. Outside of these walls, how many of us give God the glory for the healing in our lives? As we go to prayer, I want you to think about some way that God's helped you and healed you. Or a family member, physically or spiritually. Have you told him thank you? That's the start. He doesn't heal because he wants to thank you. He heals us out of his love, which we can't earn and don't deserve. We owe him a thank you because he heals us out of his love, which we can't earn and don't deserve. I'm going to ask you my stand with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we start this prayer off with thank you. Father, just in the history of this church, there's so many thank yous. It's not even funny. So much that you have done for us, every person that we have touched is because of you. And we are blessed that you have used us. Father, every door you've opened for us, this building is a huge blessing, Father. Every door that's opened while we were having to go from place to place, Father, every person that we've touched 
And Father, all of us, every one of us that's listening to this, every one of us that's here, every one of us that has been, that will be listening to this, Father, thank you. Thank you for all that you do for us. And Father, help us to, to show our gratitude outside of these walls. Father, not in bragging or hollow displays, but in genuine living. In trying to be more like Jesus in the way we care about others. In trying to be more like Jesus in our words, in our actions. and It's not the big things. It's not the big displays. It's just being a little bit more like you in how we deal with other folks and give gratitude for what all you do for us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.